Welcome, one and all. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. I am Lilymoon961, and today I am very excited to review Nightstar, the fifth installment of Allison Noel's Immortal series. Why am I excited, you ask? Well, after Dark Flame, Nightstar is a much needed breath of fresh air, my friends. Much needed indeed. Whew. If you guys have not seen my previous reviews regarding this series, please check them out before watching this review as it will spoil all the books prior to this one. The links to the reviews will be available in the description below. With all of that said, let's start with a brief summary of the story. Nightstar takes place a few weeks after the conclusion of Dark Flame, where Roman is done in by none other than Jude. You know, the love triangle character nobody wanted. But now that he's here, he may as well do some important stuff, right? Right? Shortly after Jude kills Roman, Haven storms into the scene and she sees Ever cradling what is left of Roman, which is nothing more than a white linen shirt stained with the antidote he was about to give her. This prompts our favorite mean girl to swear vengeance upon not only Ever, but Jude as well. Ever tries to convince Haven that the whole thing was a terrible accident, but obviously Haven does not believe her. She storms out and well, that's the end of Dark Flame. As summer ends with the death of Roman, Ever returns to school and discovers a terrible secret about Damon. So terrible, in fact, that it prompts her to rethink her entire relationship with him and with Jude as well. All the while, Haven is becoming more and more unstable as time goes on, becoming a danger not only to the protagonists and their loved ones, but to herself. Question is, can Ever stand to do what must be done? Can she really bring herself to kill her former best friend? Nightstar does not introduce new characters, however, it does bring some side characters who have been in the background all along to the forefront. These include Stacia, Honor, Ever's Aunt Sabine, and Mr. Munoz, Ever's old history teacher. Now that we've established the summary and list of characters, let's dive into the good and the bad. Considering how horrendous Dark Flame was, Nightstar feels like a phenomenal turnaround. Despite this though, Nightstar still has its fair share of problems, with its biggest being the whole, sex is the ultimate happiness plotline. Of course, that problem has been around since the end of Blue Moon, so at this point, it's just expected that you're going to have to deal with that particular plotline. Since its other problems are fairly minimal, let's hurry through the madness so I can talk about why Nightstar is a million times better, despite having the whole, sex is the ultimate happiness plotline. One of the bigger problems with Nightstar is something that I can forgive, but most probably can't. In this book, Allison Noel decides to break one of the rules of the universe she created to save the protagonist from death. The reason why this was done makes perfect sense to the narrative and also offers a tiny bit of redemption for Damon's character in my eyes. Not because Ever sees him as perfect, but because she is able to accept his flaws, her own flaws, and follow her heart without regrets. The only problem is that it still kind of feels like that one scene in the first season of Sword Art Online. Warning. Spoilers for a part of Sword Art Online if you've never seen it. If you want to avoid it, skip to whatever number flashes on the screen. Anyway, in this scene, have y'all left yet? Wait, hold on, let me wait. Okay, by now you should have left. If you haven't left yet, prepare to get spoiled. So, in this scene of Sword Art Online, main love interest Asuna dies sacrificing herself for Kirito. Kirito, lost in grief, weakly tries to fight Kaiba Akihiko, only to be run through with his blade. His health bar drops to zero and Kirito is supposed to die, not just in the game, but in real life as per the rules of the show. Yet for some reason, Kirito, through the sheer power of will, is able to not die and he's able to stab Kaiba, thus winning Sword Art Online. In the next scene, we see not only Kirito alive in game, but Asuna as well even though she should most definitely be dead. Like her brain should have been fried, the nerve gear should have took her out, and yet, nope, just because she's, you know, the main love interest. Hi, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not gonna get into that. It, it, it's a dead horse. Moving on. For simplicity's sake, 
Let's just say that something similar happens in this book. It's a cop-out and most people are going to have major problems with this. The only reason I don't have a huge problem with it is because something truly wonderful does come out of it. There's a clear purpose behind the rule breaking. It's contrived and even a little corny, but after Shadowland and especially Dark Flame, corny is appreciated. I don't mind, I don't mind. I'm good with corny. Just don't don't go to the depths of Dark Flame again. Oh God, the memories are coming back. I, oh Lord, the flashbacks, help me Jesus. <laughs> Two hours later. <sighs> okay, so another problem with Nightstar is that it recycles an older plot point from Shadowland. Again, I understand the reasoning behind it and the plot recycling itself isn't the actual problem since it's done for a symbolic reason. The problem is that every book after Evermore has the same sort of ending where something tragically bad happens. It's so expected now that a good amount of drama is taken out of what's been a really engaging story. For me, it's not a huge problem, but for someone else, it could be really grating. Nightstar's ending is slightly different in that there are two chapters after the tragically bad situation. So rather than the typical, you know, bad situation that ends tragically and then like one chapter afterward where Ever's just feeling guilty and whatnot, there's another additional chapter that's really only there to introduce a plot for the final book. And that, that brings me to the final problem with Nightstar. <sighs> yeah, why is this not the last book? <sighs> Just why? Why is this not the last book? Having read Everlasting at this point, I can see why Alice and Noel believed it necessary to have a sixth book in this series, but I still really wish she would have wrapped up the narrative within this book somehow. So much has been resolved within this one story and it just seemed silly to me that this madness had to get dragged out for another 320 pages because this book was one I enjoyed pretty much all the way through. I wanted the series to end on that high note, but instead I just felt exasperated because at the end of Nightstar I thought, you know, I liked this book. Not bad. And then a couple seconds later, it's like, wait a second, this isn't the end. This series isn't over. Oh no, not another one. I can't deal with this anymore. Why? Why? Oh. Oh. So yeah, in general, I just wanted Nightstar to be the final book. Not because Everlasting is bad. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to why later. But just, I still wish that Nightstar would have been the end. I really do. So now that I've dished out my short list of complaints, let's delve into the long list of great things about this book. The story of Nightstar is very layered. There are many conflicts that were brushed aside or introduced in the previous two books that are now finally, finally, getting the attention they so rightfully deserve. For example, near the end of Dark Flame, Ever's aunt finds out that Ever has been working at Mystics and Moonbeams as a psychic. Sabine's character up until this point has mostly been that of a concerned parent figure. Up until the end of Dark Flame, she had been pushed aside mostly. However, throughout those books, Sabine has become increasingly concerned about her niece, convinced that something is wrong due to the signs that she sees. As an immortal, Ever doesn't really need to eat anymore, so she mostly just drank her elixir and poked at her food every once in a while to try and keep up appearances. So Haven, she didn't have an eating disorder. Sorry, Dark Flame is still in my mind. It's just, I can't really get over the awfulness of it, but anyway. But moving on, moving on. She also had a random growth spurt in the second book, which prompted confusion from Sabine since the girl wasn't eating. Throughout this series, she's been looking for signs of mental distress in Ever while also building a budding romance with Ever's history teacher, Mr. Munoz. In Dark Flame, when Sabine finds out about Ever's psychic powers, she refuses to believe it, seeing this as a sign, a true, true sign that Ever is disturbed in some way or that she's starved for attention. This creates tension between her and Ever. And let me just say, their relationship and the pain Ever feels from Sabine's rejection within Nightstar is done extremely well. It's realistic for Sabine, a lawyer who sees the world in a very black and white way, to freak out about this, especially since Ever is living in the gray zone and has been lying about all these things all this time. She says hurtful things to Ever. Ever says hurtful things back to her. And this is the reality of what happens in family sometimes. 
Ever has to acknowledge the possibility that Sabine won't accept her as she is or the choices she has made. Sabine is having to deal with her entire worldview being challenged by something she doesn't understand or doesn't want to understand. She's simply worried about Ever, but in this book she's acting out in a highly critical way that only serves to push Ever away more. These sorts of things can and do break up family relationships, and both parties in this case have a justified reason for feeling the way they do. I like that this is written realistically and that neither Ever or Sabine react in the best of ways to one another. It's something I can relate to, and that's one of the things that had been missing since Shadowland, Ever being relatable and her situations being relatable. Another conflict that comes about fixes a major problem that I had been struggling with since Shadowland. Ever being way too forgiving of Damon, or rather ever forgiving Damon without taking the time to think over the information he had shared with her. In this book, Ever discovers something especially terrible that Damon did in one of her past lives, something he tried extremely hard to hide. And when she finds out, she reacts like a normal person would. She gets angry, saying things like, is this some sort of sick game you're playing? Is this how you get your kicks? Tell me, Damon, just how many times in how many lives have you pulled me away from my family and friends? Ooh, yes, I love that line. Finally, some real anger from this woman. Ooh, it's about time. It's just like raise the anthem. It's like go girl power in this moment because goodness, Damon, what the heck were you thinking, man? Just why did you do such terrible things? The answer is quite simple, baby cakes. I wanted to get my sweet ever in between those covers and get it on. Ah, baby, let's get it on. Hey, are you okay? Nope. My sanity is about 10 seconds away from breaking. Again, you should probably clear the building. Fast. <laughs> oh, dear God. Hang on. Wait. Last time this happened, you destroyed half our offices. <laughs> What's the damn ticket out the other half? <laughs> Jungkook would have the day off today. Hey, really? What did I expect? For crying out expect? loud. <laughs> Better call him up. <laughs> May as well prepare the smelling salts, too. <laughs> this is going to be a long day. Ever then puts distance between herself and Damon, and she thinks over everything she's gone through because of him and about what to do moving forward. She ponders his habit to make choices about her life without her consent, how he abandoned her family, and how his selfishness created pain over and over again. She spends a good amount of time thinking over these things, contemplating if she should even be with Damon at all. She even considers that maybe, just maybe, she should have been with Jude. That conflict? comes across extremely well, especially since this book takes a little time at the beginning to actually build Ever and Damon's friendship with one another, and not just their mindless attraction to one another. So yes, good job, Alice and Noel. That was, that was good. The third conflict that presents itself is Haven. Now, as y'all know, I have spent a lot of time talking about how much I despise Haven. In this book, the scenes with Haven are expertly Crafted. Her hatred of Ever is so intense, even though it's unwarranted. Drunk on the power of immortality, she becomes more and more unstable to the point where she turns into a monster of her own making. Haven is menacing, not because she says particularly vindictive things, but because there's an unpredictability to how cruel she can actually be. There's a real sense of dread that you feel whenever she appears in a scene, especially when it's unexpected. For example, listen to how Ever narrates this. And I've just walked through the side door and am about to make my way up the stairs to my room when it hits me. A cold blast of energy. The effect so stinging and frigid it can only mean one thing. I'm not nearly as alone as I thought. I spin on my heel, not the least bit surprised to find Haven standing behind me. Her body fidgety, twitchy. Her formerly beautiful face reduced to a shockingly pale arrangement of sunken cheekbones. A sharply angled nose, grim shrunken lips, and eyes so narrowed and hollowed and red. It's like gazing upon a crime scene photo. Her lips twisting in a way so gruesome it instantly transforms her into a vision even more lurid. 
than she was just a moment ago. Haven has an eerie feel to her now. She's not a petty teenager anymore. Roman's death sent her in a tailspin and she's so consumed by hate that she's lost herself in it. Ever struggles between wanting to help her former friend and knowing that Haven has to be stopped before she spins out of control and takes her rage out on everyone. Like seriously, Haven transforms from an evil queen bee to crazed serial killer in an extremely short time span. And even though I have never liked Haven and still don't, I ended up feeling pity for her because now she really is crying out for someone to help her. Because now she truly is isolated. Believing her best friend killed the man she loved, she's determined in her mind that she's destined to be a lone wolf facing eternity alone and has wrongfully placed the blame for all of the hurt in her life on ever. It's sad. It's just really sad. These three major conflicts are crafted wonderfully. The writing is vastly superior in this book to its predecessors. Not sure what happened, but this book feels like a literal revival of the series. The characters are written in a more mature fashion than they have been, Damon and Ever especially. Damon himself is forced to grow and change in response to Ever's anger with him. Ever is forced to confront the underlying problems she's refused to think about in the earlier books. Nightstar rewards you for getting through Shadowland and Dark Flame. Getting through those books helps you to understand the greater theme being presented, a theme about how love strengthens and hate weakens. By Nightstar, Ever has truly matured and gained an understanding of herself, has truly forgiven herself, and has come to accept the things that she cannot change. There's a beautiful scene where Miles and Ever have a conversation about life. In that conversation, Miles tells her what he wants out of life, saying, what I want more than anything is to reach the end of my life with a solid before and after picture to reflect back on, to show I did the absolute best that I could with what I was given and that my life was well lived. While that line is beautiful in itself, what makes this scene is Ever's response to his words. The second he finishes speaking, she breaks down and narrates the following lines. I may have eternal youth and beauty. I may have the gift of living forever but I'll never again have the kind of wonderful, lovely normalness that Miles just described. This is expanded on further with a line Jude says two or three chapters later when he's talking to Ever about eternal life. He says, I think you'd have to be pretty crazy to want to stay here, to choose an extra long, extended stay in such an imperfect, hate-filled world when there's something so much better waiting around the bend, so to speak. Lines like this are why I love this type of theme so much. Jude is making a great point here. Why would anyone choose immortality in a world full of hate? I know not everyone believes in God or in heaven, but I do. So this line really speaks to me. Having eternal youth and beauty in a world full of jealousy and spite is meaningless. Eternal life on earth also means eternal struggle. Within this book, Damon's long list of losses and mistakes are a testament to that. In choosing this path, he has condemned his own soul and denied himself a chance to experience what eternal life in a perfect world would be like. He also denied Ever of that chance. Ever didn't choose to become an immortal. That choice was made for her. So I'm really glad that in this book Ever finally shows some real anger and that she stops placing so much blame on herself because she's not to blame for this situation. So in this book, I feel that Ever finally makes an informed choice about Damon. Even though it's not necessarily the choice most of us would agree with, the fact that she gave herself time to really think about it shows emotional growth. Of all the books in this series, Night Star is probably the best written of the bunch on a technical and emotional level, and it's the most like the first book in that it has that addictive quality, and it has that relatability. Once you start reading, you don't want to stop reading. There's a strength to Nightstar's narrative that was missing in Shadowland and Dark Flame, just like there's a strength to Ever that was missing within those two books. So it makes me wonder if Alison Noel wrote them in that way on purpose so Ever's growth in Nightstar would really stand out to the reader. 
So if that's the case, the symbolism is really, really awesome because Dark Flame was definitely rock bottom and I will never, ever read that book again because that thing is just a tome of pure darkness that needs to be smacked around with a keyblade until it is nothing but shiny dust particles. Not even kidding. Just because that book has a purpose for existing doesn't mean I have to like it, okay? But again, Nightstar fixes a great deal of what I felt was really dragging the series and its characters down. Everyone feels more likable, and the characters you don't like, you certainly feel pity for to an extent, especially when you realize how fragile people are when grieving. Ever and Haven are a startling parallel of one another in that respect, and the book showcases it really well. So my overall opinion is this. Nightstar was a desperately needed addition to the series, and I absolutely loved it. Was it a perfect story? No. Did it have problems? Most definitely. Can I forgive those problems? You better believe I can. While I don't know if others will enjoy this particular book as much as I did, I would say that this book is worth slogging through Shadowland and Dark Flame. This book made me feel like the time I spent reading those two books was worth it, and I am highly satisfied with what I was able to get out of this particular book. Next time, I will be reviewing the final book in this series, Everlasting. Will this series have a satisfying conclusion, or will I be falling into the abyss of pure rage yet again? The only way to find out is to stick around for the next review, which will be up soon. To keep up with my uploads easier, be sure to subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you won't miss anything. Click the bell! Click the bell! Yeah! Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, press that like button and leave me a comment below too. I would absolutely love to hear from you and hear your thoughts on this book or on the series in general if you've read it. See you next time. Bye bye. See? Now was it that hard to review the book without freaking out? Or destroying everything in sight like a mad woman? Yeah, I do have a tendency to get a little too crazy. But hey, it's the nature of the beast. The only problem is that I forgot to tell them the best thing that happened in this book. And what was that? Stop. Don't encourage her. Why, I do declare I'd be delighted to tell you. In song. What have you done? Don't get mad at me. I didn't know this would happen. Do -do -do. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Witch old witch, the wicked witch. Ha. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Come on, dead. boys, join me. No thanks. Wake up, you sleepy head. Rub your eyes, get out of bed. Wake up, the wicked witch is dead. The witch is dead. She's gone where the goblins go. Below, do -do -do. below, below do -do -do. your home. Let's open up and sing And ring the bells out Ding-dongs the merry-o Sing